Hello everybody, um, welcome to uh, my talk on desert tortoises. My name is Kelly Herpinson. Uh, that is a goofy picture of me, I'm just now realizing. But um, I have been a desert field biologist since 2002, uh, working mostly with desert tortoises in the Mojave. Um, and I've been on the Mojave Desert Land Trust board uh, since 2013. So today we're going to talk about tortoises, um, a couple things. We're going to talk about the three different species of desert tortoises, uh, the, a little bit about the biology of our local species here in the Mojave, um, a bit about their threats, and um, some conservation work that's going on with them and what we can do to help. So first things first, I think a lot of people don't realize there are actually three different species of desert tortoises. Um, we only split them into three species in the last couple of years, so it's kind of a new new thing. But um, this is a map of the home ranges for each of the three species. So that light green sort of blob up north, you can kind of tell that it's um, covering the Mojave Desert in California and up into Nevada. That is the Agassiz's Desert Tortoise, or some people call it the Mojave Desert Tortoise. And then that sort of green-blue um, blob south of there in Arizona and down a little bit into Mexico is the Sonoran Desert Tortoise. And then that orange blob to the south um, in Mexico is the Sinaloan Thorn Scrub Tortoise, which is kind of a new, um, newly named species in the last couple of years. We'll see a little bit more about that in a second. So again, the first species the Mojave Desert in the Mojave Desert is Agassiz's Desert Tortoise, um, and that's what we're going to be talking about mostly today. Um, and that's sort of a typical habitat photo for um, that species. And then of course the Sonoran Desert Tortoise lives in Arizona where they have those beautiful saguaros and they get those monsoon rains that make it nice and lush. Um, the Sonoran Desert Tortoises look very similar to tortoises in the Mojave um, except they like to live under rocks more than ours do. Um, and then lastly, that Sinaloan thorn scrub tortoise lives in the tropical deciduous forest in Mexico. Um, it's a really cool tortoise. It's so interesting that it's so similar to our tortoise, but it lives in these really kind of lush uh, forests and also likes to live under rocks. And um, there's a lot of cool information about all these species that I would love to go on about. But for now, let's just talk about Agassiz's desert tortoise are our um, local species here in the Mojave. So um, for those of you who've seen them out and about, desert tortoises are really mostly only active in the spring and fall, and they can mostly be found eating, walking around and looking for stuff to eat. So they love um, eating those annual um, flowers and grasses that come up and a real special treat are getting those beaver tail cactuses and their fruits in the spring like that guy on the left is getting. Um, they just, yeah, love the spring annuals and um, a little bit about their burrows. So desert tortoises spend more than 90% of their time underground. Um, so like I said, they're really only active for these kind of short stints in the spring and fall and then in the summer they're sort of mostly hanging out either in a shallow burrow or under shrubs um, and then in the winter they're um, basically hibernating so they spend a lot of time in these burrows and they'll um, dig a number of them and that uh, picture on the right is a sort of typical Mojave Desert tortoise burrow you'll see just sort of dug right into the ground um, they have that half moon shape. One thing um, to look for if you're trying to figure out if it's a tortoise burrow is if the sides of the burrow have a really sort of fine, small angle. You can see in that bottom left photo, the edges of the burrow have that nice sort of acute angle. Um, and you can tell that a tortoise has used its um, 
like kind of the claws and nails on its hand to really clean out and dig out that burrow. Um, if you see a burrow that's really round or maybe taller than it is wide, that's probably a fox or coyote burrow or some kind of canid or mammal. Um, but tortoise burrows really typically tend to be that half moon shape with those really fine angles on the side. And then that top left picture is, um, you can't really, with, I didn't do a great job of showing you the, the whole picture, but um, it's they'll also live under rocks and sort of burrow underneath um, coverings like a rock or even under shrubs and that kind of thing. So um, a little bit more about burrows. So this is a photo from a wildlife sign in Florida. It's actually a photo of a gopher tortoise, which is a tortoise in the southeast. It's a um, related species, same genus, um, but I really liked this illustration because one of the big reasons that tortoises are really important uh, to the desert is we consider them to be ecosystem engineers, which means that they are actually digging these structures, their burrows, that are used by tons of different species. So these species in this picture aren't necessarily um, the ones we have here in the Mojave, um, but it's a good representation that things like rodents, snakes, amphibians, lizards, rabbits, um, even here we have burrowing owls that will use them and a ton of insects and spiders are all actually relying on desert tortoises to dig these burrows that they can also use as refuge from the hot or cold or just plain um, not nice to be in <laughs> Mojave desert weather. So um, even though it's not quite depicting, you know, they're not all living in there together per se, like this picture shows, but um, the, both all these species will use burrows at different times. Although you do see uh, snakes wrapped around tortoises once in a while. It's kind of a fun thing to see if you see a tortoise in a burrow. Um, occasionally you'll see a little rattlesnake right on top using, using the tortoise as like a heat rock once in a while. But um, anyways, the point being those burrows are super important resources for lots of species in the desert. So a quick, quick little science slide. I, I wanted to take a minute to talk about um, the actual numbers of tortoises in the desert and what's actually happening out there. And um, this is a paper that was published by the Fish and Wildlife Service last in 2018, um, showing um, the decline in numbers still. So what you're looking at um, on that, that graphic on the right side where there's five different plots, those are five different parts of the range of the desert tortoise. So the Colorado Desert, Western Mojave, Eastern Mojave, and Northeastern Mojave, and then the Upper Virgin River is up in Utah. Um, they are showing uh, 2004 to 2014. So just that 10 year span, um, the numbers are really declining. You might notice that Northeastern Mojave group um, is actually increasing a tiny bit. That's up in Nevada. Um, but on the whole, the species is really still declining. And um, they went through a, a larger decline really in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and that's when the species was listed was um, in 1990-ish. So the species is really still not doing great. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about um, why that's happening. So this is a great uh, graphic that Tim Shields created, um, really showing all of the different threats that uh, a desert tortoise is up against right now. So we have mining, military land use, grazing, off-highway vehicles, disease, urbanization, predators, energy, agriculture, invasive plants, rails, roads, and power lines. All of these things are sort of working in this tangled web to really make life difficult <laughs> for desert tortoises. And um, in various different ways from just losing their habitat to uh, taking away their food sources and things like that. So there's a lot going on. And I'm not going to talk about all of these things today, but I am going to highlight a couple of um, 
a couple of the threats that are that are facing the tortoise. Um, the first I'm going to talk about is ravens, and um, you may have heard a bunch about uh, the relationship between ravens and desert tortoises. Um, so first of all, the common raven is you know, before we talk about how destructive it is <laughs> for tortoises, I just want to take a minute. It's a really cool bird and um, they're super interesting. They're incredibly smart, one of the smartest species on the planet. Um, they're, they're social, they live in these big family groups. And that picture on the left is a courtship sort of flight that they're doing. They love to play. Um, they're really interesting birds. Um, and they are native to the Mojave. They were, have always been here. However, since humans came, um, the numbers have really blown up. I mean, by 700%, the numbers have increased just in the last couple decades. So um, the numbers of ravens are just astronomical. If you live out there, you spend time in the desert, you see ravens. Sometimes you see lots of ravens. Um, and one of the reasons that that is has to do with um, energy transmission. So basically what happened is they there are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of transmission lines that crisscross the entire Mojave Desert. And what that's done is just create tons of places for ravens to nest. So naturally, um, before the power lines were there, native, uh, um, excuse me, ravens would only nest really up in sort of cliff faces, sometimes in Joshua trees, you know, they wanted to be high up, but there's just not that many places to nest high up in the desert. Um, you're really limited to the mountains and some tall trees. So once the transmission lines came in, just crisscrossing all over the desert, um, each of those power towers has become a place that ravens can nest. And they do. In fact, they nest on a lot of them. <laughs> and so creating a place for them to nest was step one. And then step two is that the ravens love to eat baby tortoises. So they can't get enough of them. They're delicious. Um, we call little babies, sometimes we just call them little cookies. Uh, so the ravens will come, you can see this photo. Um, these are a bunch of baby tortoises that um, the ravens peck through the top of their shell. So you can see the holes in the shell and sort of slurp up the insides. And I believe that all of these shells came from one raven nest. Um, so especially in the spring when the ravens have their babies and the babies need lots of food to eat, the um, moms are going out and looking for any food they can find and they find these baby tortoises and bring them back to the nest. So you can imagine that um, this has had a huge negative impact on tortoises and the tortoises ability to thrive, um, especially in areas where these transmission lines exist, but not, it's not just the transmission lines, it's it's all over. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, things we can do to help later. But I wanted to move on to another threat, uh, energy development. So another thing that has um, really impacted the Mojave Desert and the tortoise, and if not all <laughs> species in the desert, is these large scale um, energy projects um, that are massive. And although the Endangered Species Act has provided for um, resources so that for the most part, uh, no individual tortoises are killed um, on these projects, they're just displaced and put somewhere else. Um, but what's happening is these projects are really fracturing the landscape. Um, and so it's making it more difficult for populations of tortoise on one side um, to sort of interact with populations on the other side. And that uh, does things like separate them genetically and causes problems um, and makes the, the species fractured, which makes it less able to sort of survive in the long run. So this is something that um, 
a lot of people are working on to fix and help and sort of evolve our practices so that we can better make better decisions to um, get people the energy they need, but also um, protect the species in a way that's really meaningful and useful. So one of the things happening right now that I think is exciting is there's a lot of research and work going on in um, thinking about those wildlife linkages and corridors and how can we leverage those spaces um, between projects or between developments um, and really make sure that uh, the tortoise populations are able to have these corridors between them. And again, not just tortoises, this is true for all species. We need to really make sure that um, we're protecting spaces in between develop in between developments to allow for um, species to move between. So on to a slightly less depressing part of the talk. Um, what can we do to help? So humans are really the problem here and we can also be the solution. So um, I want to talk about a little bit of a little bit about things we can do as individuals. Um, to help out. So a question I often get is, you know, people will see a tortoise somewhere and they want to know what they can do. So um, if you see a tortoise in the road, um, go ahead and move it out of the road um, and move it in the direction it was going. You just need to literally drop it off a couple feet off of the side of the road on the other side. No need to move it somewhere else. Do not put it in your car and drive it somewhere else just get it out of harm's way. Um, and I say that because the second, the second thing I'm going to say is, um, if you see a tortoise in the wild, just leave it be. We really don't want to touch tortoises. We don't want to approach them. We don't want to harass them or scare them. It's of course against the law to do that. It's a protected species. Um, but part of the reason that that is, is they're actually pretty uh, fragile and vulnerable, especially because a lot of times if they get scared, they're, they'll void their bladder. And the issue there is that um, tortoises use their bladder, they're kind of like camels, where that's sort of their water supply. So they can drink lots of water in the spring, rain, um, and then in the middle of summer, their body is still able to sort of be absorbing that water throughout um, over a long period of time. So that's really important to them. That's how they're able to survive in the desert is um, they'll drink lots of water when they can and then store it in their bladder. And if they get scared, they will pee like a lot of animals do. Um, and so that will happen if you pick one up. And I know I said it was okay if they're crossing the road, but that's because um, I think getting hit by a car is a real, real problem. Um, so anyways, if you see one, uh, just leave it be. If you see it and you're, I think a lot of people just see them and they want to make sure they're in the right place and they're concerned about them and it's exciting, but just, um, uh, just let it go, um, and leave it be and, and, you know, take a minute to observe it and get to see it and, and move on. Okay. So again, helping to deter ravens. So um, one of the big reasons that ravens numbers have grown as well um, in town or around houses is because of trash. They love trash. They love to get um, food <laughs> from, from us. So just keeping your trash receptacles closed, keep trash from blowing around. Um, if you happen to own a business in town and you have big dumpsters, if you can just keep the dumpsters closed, uh, that makes a big difference. Um, just removing all of these sort of resources that we've created for ravens will um, hopefully help um, lower their numbers. Um, and I've also added avoiding creating pools of water. They also love um, water or irrigation and that kind of thing. So anything you can do to sort of minimize that would be great. And then lastly, um, supporting conservation land acquisition. So I really think this is one of the most important things you can do to help tortoises and the, all of the other incredible species in the desert, is supporting organizations like the Mojave Desert Land Trust 
um, who are really working and putting all of their resources into acquiring and restoring land and educating the public about the importance of the desert. Um, those are some big pieces of the puzzle that make direct impacts. And as time goes on and climate change is becoming more of an issue and development is becoming more of an issue, um, I really think we need to double down on this. Um, it's a big deal. And I think that what the land trust is doing is having a, a huge positive effect um, for not again not only the tortoise but the whole ecosystem in general it's such a special and unique place and um i've been on the board for seven years now and i i can't take any credit for <laughs> the incredible work that they've done but i've been able to see what they do and see how hard um, the staff works and i'm just so impressed and inspired um, by the work that they're able to do and, and again i really think it's incredibly important and one of the best tools we have for for conserving tortoises so on that note um thank you uh for coming to my talk and i hope to meet some of you in the future and thank you for supporting the land trust all right thank you